You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are listening to Watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Well, it's no secret we've been a raging bull on uranium ever since Sprott shook up the space and started the uranium ETF. I'm not sure what they do with all that uranium in the long run, but it certainly has been a catalyst to driving uranium prices higher. And we are really, we're really fortunate to have Justin Hewn with us now. And Justin, you are the proprietor of Uranium Insider. Hey, how'd you get into the uranium space? I actually, I, I learned kind of of the thesis through a podcast back in 2016 and um, was lucky enough to actually have that thesis come to me within maybe 30 day period of the actual low for the physical commodity, the low price print, December 2016. I think it was within a month or two of that. Um, I obviously was intrigued based on the performance of the previous bull market and uh, investors' successes during that raging run and the potential for that to possibly happen again in some shape or another. And, um, you know, prior to that, I had primarily been a, a technical trader, a momentum trader, and this was an entirely different ball game. This came, it came at me as a, as a super, super contrarian bet that a sector that was absolutely hated, completely bombed out. The commodity had basically gone on a precipitous decline from 2011 all the way until late 2016 was the bottom for spot uranium. And it was a, a slightly uh, a slight growth story at the time, you know, maybe one to two percent per year uh, in growth of nuclear demand. Um, still had a lot of supply to work through, but you know the bet was on the sector going from terrible to just bad and, and seeing some recovery in the price of the commodity. And that worked out decently well for a few years, even though the equities continued to kind of move sideways to down as the commodity started to recover. And as you mentioned, Sprott came in, uh, took over U Uranium Participation Corporation in 2021, has since then bought 45 million pounds of uranium. They now hold 63 million pounds of uranium. What are they going to do with all that? Well, that's that's yet to be seen. As of now, they hold it and, and give investors exposure to holding the commodity itself. So that's been a major catalyst. And since I first heard about the thesis, like I said, it went from very simple supply and demand story to a full on nuclear renaissance where we're having uh, record numbers of build outs and uh, a lot of countries kind of flipping to pro nuclear in the past year, year and a half. Um, environmentalists starting to embrace nuclear. It's It's been a complete sea change for the story and its story's only gotten better. Yeah, even Japan uh, is uh, restarting their nukes. I had a uh, oil guy on, he runs an oil company, um, drilling, little exploration, recompletions, things like that. And he's in um, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas. And what he tells me is that the age of fracking is going to be gone in the next two or three years. So effectively, all the things the government's doing to encourage uh, electrical uh, EVs and uh, and power, uh, solar power and windmill, uh, they might be doing it for the wrong reasons, uh, saving the planet because, you know, everything we do as human beings on the planet has an impact on the planet, but doing, uh, you know, sometimes doing the right thing for the wrong reasons uh, is okay. Yeah, well said. It's, you know, I, I don't study the oil market sufficient to say whether or not oil production has peaked, but I think it's probably safer to say that we may have hit peak cheap oil um, and that that's going to affect things going forward. And you're absolutely right. The electrification of everything, and it's not just here in the States, you know, it's this is being pushed in most of the Western world, and um, it's it's really it's really in, informing policy going forward. And I think that there's been sort of a come to Jesus moment for a lot of the a lot of the uh, governments that have made this push. That finally they're recognizing, oh, we we really can't do this. The math doesn't add up based on renewables alone because of their intermittency. You know, we need some clean base load power, and nuclear is finally very much being included in that conversation. In most countries, there's still some ideologically uh, attached countries such as Germany or Belgium that are 
uh, Austria that are remaining <clears throat> anti-nuclear against all odds. But we're seeing a big shift. And like you mentioned, Japan, they've restarted uh, 10 reactors so far. Uh, of the 53 that were once operating, now about 20 of those have been permanently decommissioned. But there's still 33 operable reactors and only 10 have been restarted. Uh, three more should be restarted this year. And they're pushing to have 20 to 22 percent nuclear by 2030. That's six and a half years away. And that means another 15 to 20 reactors restarted in, in the next six and a half years. That's a big push for Japan, especially considering that they are the country that's experienced the most recent nuclear accident. They're the only country that's experienced, you know, nuclear devastation from from a from an atomic uh, bomb. And now the, the Japan is actually in recent polling majority in favor of returning to nuclear, which is an astonishing statistic. And they, they made some crucial errors um, in building their retention ponds the way they did it above the reactors. And uh, hopefully that will all be remediated. But you know, as far as safety of nuclear power plants. I think the older ones, there are some inherent risks, but the newer ones coming online, they've learned from all those mistakes, hopefully, uh, really ex extraordinarily safe, these new plants coming online. And the plants for, that are built in the last 10, 15 years all have streamlined designs, all much safer. Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Gold Terra Resource Corp. is a gold exploration company that has assembled a highly prospective district-scale land position on the doorstep of the city of Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. Gold Terra is currently focused on expanding and delineating gold resources at the company's Yellowknife City Gold Project with the goal of discovering over 5 million ounces. With ready access to infrastructure and multiple high-grade gold discoveries, Gold Terra is on track to re-establishing Yellowknife as one of the premier gold mining districts in Canada. Gold Terra trades as YGT in Toronto and YGTFF on the OTC. For more information, go to goldterracorp.com. That's goldterracorp.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, there's there's still, uh, you know, the word nuclear still tends to associate with with a lot of fear, uh, even though statistically it actually is the safest form of electricity that's ever been conceived and ever been built. Um, like Fukushima, and, and I think you brought up a great example, is that the Fukushima Daiichi accident resulted in zero deaths, yet it was a big wake-up call to the entire industry to shore up their safety protocols. So absolutely. And some of the older reactors, you know, some of these uh, French reactors were ha have been having some problems with corrosion. There was kind of a design problem in a number of reactors and some of the, the piping was having corrosion. They're having to shore that up. But, you know, it wasn't anywhere near um, coming down to any sort of meltdown or accident like that. It was just, uh, you know, just a simple mechanical problem that they've had to address. Um, and yeah, that happens. But, you know, just today news came out that the, uh, the South Africans are extending their plant um, by another 20 years, it's almost 2000 megawatts. It's getting another 20 year extension. We're hearing about these life extensions, you know, just about every week, there's another, another life extension somewhere in addition to the new builds and the new builds are continuing to gain steam. And, you know, China has been the big new growth story for a while. They have about 52 gigawatts <clears throat> of nuclear currently, and they are shooting for 200 gigawatts by 2035. So that would be another about 140 reactors started in the next, uh, let's see, 12 years. That's pretty incredible build out plans. They reiterated that plan a few months back in some uh, government statements. They are a big growth story, yet we are hearing um, just earlier this week, the Department of Energy in the United States released something that they're calling liftoff reports. They're pushing very hard towards these decarbonization goals. Um, and one of those reports is based on, quote unquote, advanced nuclear. This is kind of the next generation of nuclear reactors. These are uh, uh, usually different uh, types of designs. I mean, some of them are light, are light water advanced reactors, but some of them are also gas cooled reactors. Um, and, and so these new reactors have higher efficiencies, better safety protocols, safety mechanisms built in. And uh, the U.S. Department of Energy is pushing hard for these. So this goal that they were stating in this liftoff report is shooting for an additional 200 gigawatts of nuclear 
by 2050 with an emphasis on getting this going before 2030. Uh, that would be a tripling of the existing fleet in the United States um, in the next 20 to 25 years, which is an astonishing goal. I, whether or not they meet that, I don't know. But the fact that the United States government, federal government, is actually using language like this was beyond our wildest dreams just a couple of years ago. Right. We've had nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and submarines for decades, and they use nuclear reactors, just uh, similar to what a power plant would, only on a smaller scale. And uh, they've been extraordinarily safe. It's absolutely true. Yeah, the small modular reactors have been around for a long time, just uh, just at sea. So now that concept is starting to um, gain some momentum on land. And uh, literally every day, there's a new story about an SMR somewhere. Um, there, the United States... Canada and Poland are now pushing this uh, GE, GE Hitachi BWRX 300 small modular reactor. Um, there's two small modular reactors that are getting federal funding in the United States, these demonstration projects. These are the Terra Powers Natrium Reactor, which is set to be constructed in Wyoming, um, X Energy's XE100, which is the first one set to be built in Washington. And it's, it's really, really gaining a lot of momentum for these small modular reactors. And, you know, the there's nothing really inherently wrong with the large scale reactors, but I think it's an easier sell. Uh, there's something about the reactors being smaller and you can, you can uh, frame a story about them being safer that I think it's going to be an easier pill for the public to swallow in terms of moving towards nuclear. And a lot of these designs have a new ability to uh, cycle up and down a little bit more easily, which makes them more viable to be utilized within grids with renewables if they can cycle up and down and match match that load match that intermittency so that's that's another big selling point yeah the uh, nuclear power plant of yesteryear was like your uh computer server you know you could shut it down if you really had to but you never wanted to because you never knew if it was going to restart or not yeah the the reactors right now are are uh, very very consistent very high efficiency that are operating for the most part so that <clears throat> that's actually a big part of the demand story is demand is very stable uh, stable and growing. So it's, it's, you don't really have major shocks to the demand story with an exception of something like the Fukushima Daiichi accident, which is really what led to the bear market. It was, it was poor for sentiment and, and not helpful for the nuclear story, of course, for uh, a number of years. But the fact that the entire fleet shut down, that was a big hit to demand. Now we're seeing demand. So those one to two percent projections from, let's say, five years ago, we now have the WNA, the World Nuclear Association. They put out a nuclear fuel report every two years, and they are projecting in their reference case, which is kind of the average projection for supply and demand. The reference case from the WNA is looking at 4.9% growth to 2040. Uh, so it's, it's a very quickly growing space. Yeah, no question about it. So tell us about your publication, Uranium Insider. How do you cover the industry uh, you're covering? Just tell us, give it briefly, tell us about it. Sure. Yeah, we have uh, we have recommended positioning. So we have a what we call our focus list. It's ten positions within the space. What we feel are the best risk reward investment opportunities. We put out a forty plus page newsletter every month. We do uh, uh, the focus is primarily on macro, but of, of course we cover the companies as well. Um, we do a month uh, every month. We do a two hour long members only webinar. We usually have a member of management from one of the companies we recommend or uh, an industry. Uh, player, somebody that's working in the nuclear industry to speak about the actual structural nature of the of the commodity space, um, and then we we uh, we issue email bulletins, um, trade alerts, and I do daily update videos as well. So it's a pretty comprehensive service. Uh, I have a a business partner who's uh, now become a good friend. He's a long time uh, retired hedge fund manager, been in the metal space for more than two decades, um, and a great small team behind me. And we've been doing it since August of 2019. We've had a pretty big pullback here over the past 12 to 18 months. So the valuations are literally back to where they were at the beginning of the bull market on a relative basis to the commodity. So even though uranium is up from 30 to 50 bucks, the equities are generally up from that time period, but they've had a big pullback. So even with that said, we're still up over 300% since uh, August of 2019 for our portfolio and um, having a great time. I'm very excited about where this is going and it's, uh, it's a great story. All right. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing this with us, sharing this news and the state of the industry, Justin. And again, it's uraniuminsider.com. 
you got a question for Justin, shoot us an email, kl at carryletz.com. You'll find the link to uraniuminsider.com in the show notes of this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. While you're there, please sign up for our free newsletter. Justin, pleasure meeting you, and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks, Kerry. Happy to join you. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.